How's everyone doing? Don't mind the red face. That's what happens when you when you drink a lot, and then you stop, and you're just kind of relaxing. I feel good. Don't worry. I'm drinking Kool Aid now. And I'm snacking on little snack-sized candy bars, which, I mean, that's it's American way. So this is five scary mysteries with plot twists that'll give chills. So let's get into it. In the last 20 years, forensic technologies have advanced at an awe-inspiring rate. The scientists and experts behind these advancements dedicate their lives to studying and researching to make criminal justice better. These advancements may have been used to crack open even the coldest cases, reminding people that you can run but you cannot hide from the inevitable. Yeah. Number 5 23-year-old Diane Cusick of Nassau County, Long Island, had a passion for dancing and teaching and was known as a patient and kind young woman. Diane also had a young daughter and shared a close relationship with her parents, Bernard and Rita Martin. In the late 1960s, Diane's career was just taking off, and she was excited to see where it would lead her. Unfortunately, before Diane could make her dreams come true, her life was taken in one of the most brutal ways imaginable. On February 15, 1968, Diane finished at the dance school where she taught young children and stopped by the Green Acres Mall on her way home. She walked through the mall, browsing various shops before arriving at the dance shop. She bought herself a new pair of dance shoes and headed for the mall's exit, but she wasn't alone. A man, possibly posing as a security guard or a police officer, followed Diane to her 1961 Plymouth Valiant, and the two shared an exchange. That evening, Diane failed to return home and her parents reported her missing to the Nassau County Police Department. Bernard and Rita couldn't just sit back and wait for the police to find their daughter, so they headed out to Long Island to look for her. They recalled that on the day she disappeared, she had told them that she was going to stop by the mall. Bernard and Rita drove to the Greenacres Mall, and that's when they spotted Diane's Plymouth Valiant in the car park. As they grew closer, they screamed in horror. They found their beloved daughter in the back seat of her own car. She had been savagely attacked with large wounds on her body. None of her personal items had been stolen, and it appeared as though she might have been assaulted. The Nassau County Police Department arrived at the scene and recoiled in horror. This was like nothing they had seen before. Unbeknownst to them, a dark and dangerous serial killer was making his way through New York and Long Island. Evidence and witness accounts were collected, but Diane's case quickly went cold. In 2022, the Nassau County Cold Case Bureau decided to reopen the case with shocking results. In 1968, officers had been diligent enough to store evidence from Diane and the scene correctly. DNA testing was ordered and everyone was stunned when the results came in. The forensic examinations showed that none other than Richard Cottingham, the torso serial killer, was responsible for what happened to Diane. By 2022, Richard was already in prison for similar crimes, and he knew the forensic evidence against him was overwhelming. Richard appeared in court via video link as he'd fallen into ill health and his bed bound. While investigators couldn't coax a full confession from him, Richard did give up details that had never been released to the public. In December of 2022, Richard Cottingham received a 25-year sentence in Diane's case and received immunity in four other cases as part of his plea deal. Number four. I think if the person's in jail for a long period of time, you know they're going to die in jail. I think that you should give immunity for charges against those previous crimes only so that they will, one, confess, and two, maybe help find the body or help locate the body. But three, and I understand this is probably going to hurt the family, but the family gets closure and knows that he's already in jail for life. You can't do, you're, you can't do two lives. So just understand that we, 
we had to give up something and are able to get this. You can get your your loved one's body back. <clears throat> and you now have a peace of mind to know that their their body's back. We know who the killer is. Killer's never getting out of jail. You know, I understand maybe you want to charge him with murder, but what, what's it going to get? So I think something like that should go go forward just so we can help give families some closure. On April 23rd, 1986, 32-year-old Janet Love started her day as usual. She <clears> woke <throat> later that morning as she was due to work the 3 p.m. till 2 p.m. shift as a ticket agent for Delta Airlines at the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. Just a year previously, Janet had moved from Louisiana to Bedford, Texas to further her career. Things were shaping up nicely for Janet, and just before 2 p.m., she left her home and headed to work. The rest of the day passed without incident, and shortly after midnight, she <clears throat> pulled into the shared car park of her apartment complex on Eldon Dodson Drive. Soon after Janet entered her apartment, she heard footsteps behind her, and a man grabbed her and began attacking her. Sadly, the man greatly overpowered Janet, and his brutal attack cost her her life. It wasn't until the following day that Janet's absence was noticed. When she failed to attend work, her colleagues visited her apartment and stumbled upon a gruesome scene. The Bedford Police Department was called, and the investigation began. Investigators speculated that Janet had been attacked just after entering the apartment, and had been physically assaulted. Neighbors, Janet's friends, and family were interviewed, but very few leads came. Nobody in Janet's case could think of anyone that wanted to hurt her. Without any solid evidence, the case grew cold. Over the years, investigators revisited Janet's case, desperately looking for that golden ticket. In 2020, the Bedford Police Department finally received a federal grant from the Texas Department of Safety. This grant allowed Bedford investigators to pay for DNA testing and genealogical services. DNA recovered from Janet's body was selected and sent to a lab, and when the results returned, investigators were stunned. The Don't mind me. Just cleaning up a couple wrappers. I was snacking on some uh, little minis snickers and three musketeers and they were delicious but i had to stop because i'll be a pig to stunned. the dna and genealogical work led the scientists to one person ray anthony chapa it turns out that chapa lived in an apartment just 1000 feet from janet he had never been considered a suspect in the initial investigation and the bedford police department stated that without dna testing he would never have been considered in the case while investigators know who perpetrated this horrific crime, they're unable to get full justice for Janet. Ray Anthony Chapa passed away in January of 2021, following a battle with terminal illness. Janet's younger sister, Rebecca Roberts, commented that she felt it was better that Ray had passed because the family had been spared a long and traumatic trial. She told KDFW that while none of this will bring her sister back, it does mean that there is finally justice for her. Number three. On well, February 20... Technically, there's only justice if he's found guilty. If they charge him and then he were to get off. You know, think of uh, the Ron Goldman family. And Nicole Brown... Uh, was it Smith? Nicole Brown Smith? Nicole Brown Simpson. I know she was Simpson. I'll just call her that. Um... Ask me how, how comfortable they feel knowing that the murderer got off with got got off got away with it. They're not happy. They're not happy at all. So you know, you want them to be found guilty. And I know that goes against what I just said for the first one, given but that person was in jail for life. You understand what I'm saying? 27th, 2011, Cape Cod, Massachusetts police officers received a call out to 10 Fresh Holes Road. When they arrived, the occupants of the home and neighbors were all waiting outside, shouting in terror. 
They explained that three loud shots rang out as they were relaxing that evening, along with the sound of someone making a getaway. When investigators went inside the home, they found that the shots had seriously injured a 31-year-old Todd Lampley. Todd's girlfriend, an unknown male friend and mother who lived in the home, rushed to his side and confirmed to officers that they were uninjured. Todd was taken to the nearest hospital, but unfortunately he didn't survive. With the announcement of Todd's passing, investigators also announced that their investigation had been upgraded. A crime scene search found three spent shell casings, a phone, and oddly enough, a sweet potato. Investigators were confused as to why a sweet potato was found at the scene and Silencer. chose to focus on the phone and the casings. Was the sweet potato used as a silencer? Like just uh, an attempt, like a movie attempt at a silencer? No, because you'd have a hole in that. That would... Never mind. Days after the crime, investigators discovered the weapon hidden in a pond close to the Freshall's home, which held few clues. Investigators confirmed that the casings and weapon matched, but this didn't help them identify the weapon's owner. The sweet potato was a bizarre outlier for forensic investigators, and as it was found at the crime scene, it was processed just like any other piece of evidence. In an odd twist, forensic scientists discovered a DNA profile on the sweet potato that had apparently been used as a silencer. The DNA belonged to Devaris Hampton, a known criminal. At the time of the crime, Devaris was being monitored with an ankle bracelet, and detectives were able to use the data collected from the tracking tag to place him at the crime scene. A DNA profile was sneakily collected from Devaris in 2016, and investigators confirmed that his DNA was all over the sweet potato found at the crime scene. In March of 2023, almost 12 years after the crime was committed, 40-year-old Devaris Hampton was finally arrested. The case against Devaris is currently ongoing, and the evidence presented at trial will undoubtedly be a first for most. Investigators have drawn parallels to this case with the popular TV show The Wire, as a similar event where a vegetable was used as a silencer was featured in the show. Hmm? Number 2 In June of 1971, Rita Curran moved from Milton, Vermont to Burlington, Vermont, looking to kickstart her career. Rita was raised in a strong religious household, and the Currens held a very tight bond. Throughout school, Rita flourished, and when it was time to apply for college, there was only one choice, the University of Vermont. Rita had dreamed of becoming a teacher, and finally, her dreams were coming true. But before Rita could put all of her plans into action, the unthinkable happened. When not studying at the University of Vermont, Rita worked as a second grade teacher at a nearby school. Rita also worked at the South Burlington Colonial Motor Inn during the summer holidays to save some extra cash. On July 19, 1971, Rita returned home after a long day at work to the apartment she shared with two other girls. Rita headed straight for bed as she had to work in the morning. At around 12.30 p.m., Rita's housemates, Beverly and Carrie, returned home. They noticed that Rita was in her bedroom and made sure to keep the noise down in the living room. Beverly, Carrie, and Carrie's boyfriend chatted for a while before they decided to go to bed. As the apartment only had two bedrooms, Rita and Beverly shared a room, and at around 1 a.m., Beverly slowly crept into the room so as not to wake Rita. When Beverly looked closer at Rita's bed, she screamed in horror. Rita had been savagely attacked in her bed. Crime scene investigators ordered Beverly, Carrie, and her boyfriend out of the apartment and conducted a thorough sweep. Underneath Rita's right arm, investigators found a burnt-out cigarette butt. This was a time before DNA, but investigators ensured to collect this for future evidence, and they were right to do so. Wow. Those in Rita's life were questioned, but nobody appeared suspicious to investigators. Rita's roommates told investigators that they'd been receiving bizarre calls late at night, and the caller would breathe heavily before slamming the phone down. Due to the timeline and proximity, Ted Bundy was considered a suspect in Rita's case. Bundy had been born just down the road from Rita's apartment, and many detectives speculated that Bundy had returned to Burlington with hatred in his heart. Bundy was interviewed at late. I was 52 years ago. I'm hoping they've captured someone by then. 
I don't think it was Bundy, but that's just me saying that right now. Probably could have been. I have no idea. Bundy was interviewed at length about Rita's case, but he professed his innocence, at least in this case, till the very end. Tips and leads came in over the years, but often led nowhere. Then in 2014, investigators decided to take another look at Rita Curran's case. Her friends and family confirmed she wasn't a smoker, so who did the cigarette belong to? DNA testing was performed, but no matches were found in CODIS. Fast forward to 2022, when Parabon Nano Labs offered their services to the Burlington Police Department. The cigarette end was tested again, using much more technologically advanced methods. It took Parabon Nano Labs genealogist C.C. Moore just days to find the perpetrator. William de Roos, who lived two floors above Rita. Using DNA and family trees, C.C. Moore was able to work backwards before landing on William. A comparative DNA sample was obtained from William's half-brother, which was the final nail in the coffin. Unfortunately, justice would never truly be served, as William de Roos passed away in San Francisco in 1986. Rita's family were happy the person responsible had finally been caught and named, though. Number 1. On September 28, 1979, a letter addressed to a reporter at the Tahoe Tribune would shock the community. The note stated that a woman's body could be found at Sugar Pine Point State Park in Lake Tahoe, California. Shocked, the reporter immediately contacted the El Dorado County Sheriff's Office, who sent investigators to check it out. Hauntingly, the letter was right. At the campground in Sugar Pine Point, Officers found a white woman, aged 35 to 45, with dark, wavy hair and brown eyes. There are conflicting reports on how the woman was dressed, with some sources stating that she was wearing a lavender shirt and bell bottoms, and others saying that she wore a red shirt and jeans. All sources agreed that the woman had been wearing flip-flops, with one being found close to her body. There were obvious signs of a struggle, and it was clear to investigators that she'd been chased throughout the campsite. Investigators tried to match the woman to recent missing person reports, but nothing came of it. With no name, the authorities dubbed her the El Dorado Jane Doe. For decades, she would sit unidentified, as would the person who did this to her. In 2015, the El Dorado County Sheriff's Office decided to reopen the Jane Doe case, and photographs of jewelry, including a unique deer pendant, were shown to the public. Hundreds of miles away in Virginia, the family of 35-year-old Patricia Carnahan immediately recognized the deer pendant. Her family contacted the El Dorado County Sheriff's Office to provide a comparative DNA sample. Incredibly, the DNA test confirmed that the remains belonged to Patricia, who, according to her family, disappeared while she was on a road trip to California in 1979. Investigators now knew who the Jane Doe was, but now there was the question of catching the person responsible. In 2023, police in Washington state had a massive push on processing DNA samples collected from assaults. These kits had remained untested for years, even decades, meaning delayed justice for the victims. One of these kits from an incident in 1994 matched to a man called Harold Carpenter via CODIS. Incredibly, when the DNA sample from Patricia's body was sequenced, it also matched Harold Carpenter. Thanks to the investigators in Washington, Patricia's case had too been solved. 63-year-old Harold Carpenter had been arrested and charged with both crimes and is expected to appear in court in 2023. The headstone that once read Unidentified Female now reads Patricia Carnahan. Thank you guys so much for watching. That's, that's gotta be aggravating to know like if you have a family member who's dead who was killed and yeah we we picked up something you know cigarette butt whatever but you know it's going to take a while for us to to complete that dna check you know and then it's like a couple months no we haven't done it yet a year three years i think they're on it more now than they are, but I think if there's DNA, it should be mandatory. On a side note, I think that if a child's born and the mother and father are present, I think a DNA test of the child should be given to ensure paternity. Because if you're a man and you 
your wife, your woman, girlfriend, whatever, she cheats on you and has a child and you believe that's your child and you sign that birth certificate, you are being held legally responsible for 18 years plus. I think that's not right. Especially if you can prove it in court. That's not my kid. She lied. Birth certificate, you admitted. You said it was yours. You're screwed. And there's no ramification for the woman and there's no repercussion I mean, it's just screwed. That's uh, that's that's a completely different topic. So, like and subscribe, and uh, have a good day. Have a good night.